Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's John Myers, and welcome to the next Deep Crawl webinar. Um, fantastic topic today, as always, and obviously a great title on SEO on the edge, getting around technical barriers, which I know is a, is a hot topic. I love this topic, it's a technical SEO. And uh, we've got a fantastic speaker today to uh, to take us through this process and obviously talk about the subject. It was Mr. Dan Taylor of the Salt Agency, where he's the senior technical SEO lead. Um, so welcome, Dan, and thanks for taking the time to be on the Deep Crawl webinar today. Thank you, John. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you. And what's great is um, I remember it's kind of role reversal today, which is wonderful. Last last year I did a, a webinar where Dan grilled me. Um, so it's it's lovely to be on the other side of the fence and uh, going to get to listen in this time. And then obviously it's our, our usual sort of format, as uh, any of you regular attendees know. So for anybody that's new. We'll do around about 30 to 40 minutes of presentation from Dan, um, talking us through the subject, and then we'll really get into the Q&A around the subject as well. Um, so please, please, please do get your questions ready. Um, and don't wait till the end. We've already had our first question in for today, which is fantastic, and thank you very much for that. But submit any questions that you have as Dan's going through his presentation. Please submit them into the chat box that you'll see on the right-hand side of your screen. And um, we can we can get them all lined up and obviously get into the Q&A on the back end because it's great to be able to take those questions and field them back. You know, any speaker that presents great content loves to have questions asked about it to allow you guys to really learn as we get into that process as well. As always, the webinar is recorded. Um, we will do a recap uh, live and it will be live on the DC blog um, by tomorrow with uh, a recording and obviously a full recount. Uh, please do tweet as well. You know, get the tweets out there. I know a few of the deep callers will be tweeting as we go through the process around Dan's, Dan's content um, on the webinar, and we do love to share that social love. So please do put it out there uh, on our behalf as well. Um, and also, we love your feedback. When you guys log out of the webinar today, there's a very, very quick survey. Um, please, please, please do take the time to fill that in. We love to know how we could be doing better for these things. We get great attendance, and we always seem to get great feedback on our speakers, which is fantastic. But recommend us a session. You know, let us know a subject that you'd like to hear about. Let us know about things that we could in, improve on. Please um, take the time to do that. It really is important to us. Um, and as I mentioned, it, it's a great subject today, but this is also an award-winning talk. I'd like to point out and shout out for Dan on this one. Dan gave this talk um, at Tech SEO Boost, and we're going to be expanding on that today. And this talk and the content within this talk um, at the conference won the Best Research Award, which is a fantastic accolade at a fantastic conference. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to uh, Mr. Dan Taylor of the Salt Agency to talk us through the uh, subject of SEO on the edge and getting around those technical barriers. So Dan, the floor is yours for the next 30 to 40 minutes, and I really do look forward to coming back in and all the questions that we get. So over to you, Dan. Okay, great. Thank you, John. Um, just all checking, ah, just sharing my screen now. Yeah, has everyone got that okay? Perfect, all good. Great stuff. Um, so essentially, yeah, as John said, I kind of gave a talk around specific case studies on using Cloudflare workers and serverless applications for SEO purposes at Tech SEO Boost and separate to that, the research paper um, and sort of the testing that went into it we put into the um call to research they also ran which was quite humbling to win that especially against um sort of prestiged seos like eric Enger and obh from france as well so that was great so what i'm going to really do with this is expand sort of on that talk because i appreciate there's been a lot of articles written about this as well there's been a lot of talk on twitter and um, in slack groups about what this is how it can be used and also around the issues, not only the technical issues that this can raise, but also things around internal processes, change management, um, aggression testing, everything like that. This can pose a business because whilst it's a great opportunity, it brings new challenges to the table as well. So I'm going to start this in a similar style to what Kevin Indig started his with, with a um, big Y slide. So Essentially, the research that went behind Mix was born out of working with enterprise level clients who were trying to adapt platforms, trying to go international, even trying to migrate. But their original platforms weren't spec'd to that level, they weren't scoped properly. And it just created these barriers where essentially either 
not even just through development blockades, just certain development things weren't possible, such as me being a website from Git pages to WordPress. Git pages at the time didn't actually support redirects. So we found a solution using Powerflow workers to manage everything through the HCDN. So I'm also going to go on and speak um, and cover some of my feedback and questions. I know I've had personally around some of the issues and as a technical side, both and process led. Uh, and then I'm also going to cover off some examples of this as well. And being honest, I'm also going to probably controversially from my own point say that edge SEO and edge SEO techniques aren't for everyone. They aren't suitable for everyone and it's not intended to be sort of a silver bullet alternative to stuff because there are other alternatives to do things out there. So essentially why Edge SEO came about is simply down to really five main issues that we typically face working with clients and needed to find ways around them. These mainly are uh, set down to old legacy tech stacks uh, being held together, as I said, over duct tape, loads of patch fixes, multiple servers, um, some of these enterprise businesses we've worked with this, even running things like physical ZXTMs, uh, Zeus Extension Managers for redirects with line limits of 2800 when they've got a 1200 URL website, which they need to migrate from HTTP to HTTPS. Anything like new site builds, which being honest, just have a thing to go properly. And we're coming in at that point of saying, oh, so you want to go international, but the platform can't support HFLAN because it's a custom build. How can we implement this without spending lots of resources reinventing the wheel? Congested development queues and long lead times. So this is one thing which has got a lot of comment around. So this isn't designed to be a circumvention of development. It's to do with example, if you have a canonical URL, which is pointing to the wrong um, actual URL, and that's causing you issues, this is a temporary fix you can do to improve performance, but without taking full control in that respect. And also there's the developers who just don't like being helpful. And as that's only a small percentage of developers, but they do exist. We've all worked with them. And sometimes they just don't like doing certain things because it's not the way that things are done before. And ultimately, the fifth main one is budget, because in a few of our examples, the cost of doing things through the traditional methods or re-engineering platforms was just too high, but yet they needed to achieve certain goals in terms of organic search. And the only way to do that was through certain implementations in order for the business to grow, thrive, reverse traffic, etc. As I kind of said earlier, Edge SEO isn't designed for everyone, it's designed for Edge cases. A lot of the stuff that we can do for Cloudflare workers, we can do through CDNs normally. So we can do it through Cloudflare, Akamai, Capsular, Page Rules, um, Fastly have something similar as well. We can implement wrappers and JavaScript directly onto the CDNs and do it that way. And likewise, a lot of stuff can be done through plugins, extensions of certain platforms. There's multiple ways to do everything that this can do. It's it's as I said, it's not designed to be the big circumvention, the big alternative. It's designed for those edge cases where you literally can't even get a Google Tag Manager onto a website because the developers can't do it because of some other reasons that happened three years ago with previous dev push. But you need to get your tracking code on there for your PPC campaign. It's things like that where this can come in handy and where it's designed to be done. Injecting things like body content, everything like that, again, it can be done through CMSs, it can be done through other ways. This is designed for the edge cases, the outliers which causes the most issues as SEOs and can be big obstacles in terms of campaigns. Another thing which I just want to cover off is why I talk about Cloudflare a lot. Um, when I made these slides a week ago, they were the only actual provider that we knew of that provided a surplus application, such as Cloudflare Workers. Obviously, other CDNs do exist and are great and provide the same and can provide some of the same implementation methods. About a week ago, we noticed Fastly was starting to introduce something similar as well. But essentially, the reason why every every article I've written focused on Cloudflare is around that. I know some criticism has been around. Um, with that, we're just basically doing PR for Cloudflare product. It's just essentially they're the only ones who have built the application so far to enable us to do this. When everyone else 
get this on board and produces similar serverless applications, it's just going to benefit everyone, especially with like the market reaches of Akamai and Capsular as well. That could potentially be a huge percentage of the market where we can effectively do a Hail Mary and get some SEO fixes implemented. Another thing I just want to cover off as well, because this is a challenge I faced a lot, um, not only in conversations with brands, but also when I've written articles for certain online publications where they've changed and what they've gone through some editor processes and have actually changed the work of their worker to service worker. There is a big difference between what these two are because they are essentially two completely different technologies. A service worker works in the browser and the Cloudflare works for a serverless platform, essentially. The similarities they have are that Cloudflare workers use an API, which is quite similar to a service worker, and they have both got worker in their name. It could be named something completely different and the confusion might not be there, but I know, especially in some of the rewrites I've seen in the articles I've done, people have referred to the service workers instead of Cloudflare workers, and they're not the same thing in this context. So kind of going on to what Edge SEO actually is, and for me, this is one of the exciting things about it, because as I've kind of written for Search Engine Journal here, it's about creating a new implementation, testing and research process. It's something new that we can do. For example, if we wanted to do A-B testing previously, we'd have to sign up to a traditional vendor, um, even use just all the end, something like that, and then go through that process. Whereas if you're already on Cloudflare, A-B testing can be done quite simply through workers. We can even test things like multi-platform. So if you're moving onto a new platform, we can A-B test a product page across platform. But we want to see and later. Well, essentially, the adoption of this should be seen as another tool, another spanner in the toolkit, not a massive replacement for stuff that's already there. As I said, if you can change things through a CMS, through a plugin, if the dev queues aren't that bad, that's fantastic. This probably isn't for you. It's, as I said, for those outline edge cases. So for more sort of technical definition of what edge SEO is, and I've been asked to actually say this by my developer, um, it's a serverless application known as Worker. It's just got Cloudflare running in front of it. And it modifies requests and responses between the client and the server. So the client being the user, browser, Google bot, and the server, your actual underlying website itself, but without modifying the code base. So if you do a server response, the origin response will still come back without the modification of what you're processing in the middle section you can see here. But by modifying that request and response, we can do many, many different things. And a number of these navigate around platform restrictions, they navigate around the legacy tech stack issues. It's creating that middle ground. And some articles we've written where it's saying about giving things like the power back, things around that are things like with Salesforce, Commerce Cloud, and Shopify, where you want to do log file analysis or get more log files is hard. By collecting data on the edge in this way, we can collect a pseudo log file so we can still get the data to analyze C response codes and see that by modifying this. So the logo at the top there as well, so that is um, doing all the research and preparing for tech SEO boost. I actually just turned around to our developer and I simply just said, how easy would this be to scale it? Because although I am a tech SEO, I'm not a developer. I'm very simple and basic when it comes to writing code. I'm even more scared when it comes to writing JavaScript. I mean, I essentially said to him, how can you make this in a way where I can do this without pestering you for everything I want? So my developer essentially made the user interface. I mean, I just went, can we make this scalable? Yes. And that's where Sloth was born. So we've actually built a open source tool. Um, the code's open source and a little bit's black box where you can actually just log in and using CSV uploads or anything like that and generate your own worker codes. This is all about trying to make this an accessible um, actual technique that people can use. 
because a lot of people pioneering this are not going to be developers, they're going to be people in in-house teams who are struggling to get certain things done. But they can turn around to developers and say, how and include them in the conversations, something I'm going to come on to in more detail. But it allows them to also alleviate some of the stress over getting devs to do things as well. And it moves on from that way. So some of the things we can actually do on the edge and what we've tested, um, a lot of it is quite straightforward. So obviously we can do redirects, we can implement hreflang, uh, we can do modification of robots text, log file collection, security headers. One of the fun things we have started to be able to do is pre-rendering of JavaScript websites. Um, and by doing this, we're basically taking a cache version of a JavaScript website and pre-rendering the cache version and then serving the cache version on the edge. From the tests we've done thus far, it works as normal, as a normal pre-rendering service. But the only difference being because we're pre-rendering the cache, from what we've seen using things like pre-render IO, um, it actually reduces the cost of the server-side pre-rendering quite a bit by doing it on the edge. So it's things like this where even though there are ways to do it, this, cost, this could be a more cost-effective way, similarly with age application screens and even things like tracking pixels, um, JS overlays, and even basic tracking things for page load time. It's There are ways to do this outside of this, but a lot of SEOs will have approached the projects at one point. Where I know personally I was on what, working on one last year where I was told it'd be eight months before a canonical tag could be amended. Through this, I could have amended the canonical tag probably in a few days going through the dev sign-up process and then it could have been done properly eight months later. Workers are quite easy to turn on and off. They've got minimal latency when deploying. So even though it's still cache, when we've done testing for a page, which is about a quarter of a gig in size, there's a latency of about 20 milliseconds for it to be deployed live. So obviously big sites take longer, small sites take less. That's just where the world anyway. So going on to an example of one of the cool things we can actually do, so this is actually a live A-B test I'm doing on my site at the moment, to be honest, purely just for this webinar. So the way that we can do A-B testing through um, Cloudflow workers and Edge SEO is simply you create the two URL variants, then in the back end of actually using a simple tool, you literally just do a quick enablement you do a 50-50 split, also so you can do more than that. And then you simply just let it go. So if anyone actually on the webinar now goes to that URL um, listed above the mode and split column, they'll go, you'll go to either the control or variant. And you can just simply report on this through Google Analytics or set up a simple Google Data Studio and you can quickly and with your goals enabled and you can quickly see traffic, user engagement and even goal conversions directly from analytics for people landing on those variants. Again, there are multiple ways to do this outside of this, but if you wanted to want a quick A-B test on something, this is a very quick way to do it. You've got a 20 millisecond deployment and you're off. So the next thing I want to kind of cover off mainly is a case study um, on this is around HREF line, which was one of the actual main reasons why we started researching into this as an actual sort of solution to get around things. And as John said, that also formed um, the main focus of my talk at Tech SEO Boost as well. And the whole case study crew about how we went through validations, accessibility, I'm gonna go through a lot of that here as well. So again, on my website currently, um, as a live example, I'm using hreflang on the homepage injected crew workers for both um, English, UK, American, Russian, and French. So that's been deployed now since about July last year, and it just works as normal. So as I was saying earlier, if you still look at the origin response, you'll still see it returned without any modifications. So if we look at the home page, so on the left, you've got my browser response, and on the right, you've got my direct server response. As you can see on the right, there's no href line in the direct response, but on the modified request version on the left, it's there. So the first challenge with this and making sure this technology actually works was A, does it appear in the code? This was a straightforward yes. 
Um, I think we just did this using Visual Code Studio, just to pull both variants as a side-by-side. -side. So once we knew we could actually work it that way, we then had to establish it's great with HR plan works this way, can Google recognize it? So the way actually around this, um, John Bueller actually told us to use Google's mobile friendly testing tool um, because that renders the HTML as Google sees it. Um, so we did that, it worked. And then also at Tech SEO Boost in November, I harangued a couple of the Bing engineers and they pretty much said that if Google can see it, they can see it as well. So we know it works for Bing as well. And any, but not only just for HF Flang, any code push is pushed through this that Google can render. We also know Google uh, Bing will be able to render them as well, which is important, even though market share differs. Bing is still a search engine we have to take into account. The next question is, does it work? And testing using uh, NordVPN in Chrome and Yar browser, which is Yandex's own browser. But yeah, it was working fine. And the page is ranking, or the correct version of a page is ranking where they should be. Position, not massively important at this stage, but still actually performing well. But then ultimately, the important thing as well is, can what is done through Edge SEO be validated by non-developers and by basically in-house teams, or I'm not going to say phrase normal people, but yeah, we're non-developers. So effectively, the traditional methods of things like HF Line Checker, TechnicalSEO.com, HF Line Ninja, all tools basically that we'd normally use to check for HF Line validation. This works similarly if you're running a crawler, crawlers will pick up redirects will pick up everything as should because they're, they're basically getting back the modified response as opposed to the origin response. So everything works in that way. Now, the re one of the main reasons why we focused on hreflang, and that's one of the first tools we built in Sloth, was around one of the problems we faced with the client. So to give you an example of the scope, they had a number of websites all built on different platforms pretty much built asynchronously from each other. Uh, regional marketing teams, country marketing teams basically were allowed to go off and do whatever they wanted to do. Um, and the issue basically here was how do we then match up free WordPress, a Salesforce Commerce Cloud and two Falcon PHP sites together. The way without basically in a coordinated central way. So the way around doing this, and this is a question I've been asked on a few Slack groups as well, is in order to map these correctly, you effectively just have to make six Cloudflare instances around each of the sites and then deploy a single hreflang Cloudflare worker code to those instances. Now, that does sound complicated at first, but unless you need the PCI compliance, you could probably get away with doing this on that free account or a business account, depending on what level or size of company you are. If you are massively enterprise, I'm sure there'll be an enterprise package out of it, which is affordable to kind of get around this. But essentially, by doing this and using the six instances and the single code through things like what we've built with Sloth, you can manage that through a CSV in a central way. And regardless of what these websites then do, you've actually got the HDF line mapped. Now, in this instance, I've only included six for example countries. This business was actually 15 separate uh, CCTLDs and all the our varying countries and each and including the map as well was New Zealand, Australia, UK, US, Canada. So there's a lot of English duplication going on as well. There's a couple of IP redirects. By going through this process and putting it this way, we basically just came up with a solution to fix this without having to do massive re-engineering across 15 websites built on different platforms when the dev team weren't exactly a big team based in one country. So it created a scalable way that we could get around the problem without actually costing the client too much money and getting their, well, they developed a better, more robust, longer term solution, to be honest. So this last slide is going to be up for quite a while because it's one of the main things I wanted to really go over with this because since Tech SEO Boost and since talking to a number of brands and companies around how they can use this technology 
as well as other SEOs uh, on Slack, on Twitter, even um, conversations up to about two hours ago today surrounding how this technology actually works in terms of risks, business processes, everything like that. So the simple pros of the of this solution actually is it's a JavaScript code, API simple, deployment and pulling mid back um, can be as simple as one or two clicks. It's cost effective as well because for 10 million requests through Cloudflare's network, it costs five dollars and then 50 cents per additional million. For some things, if you've got a big site, you can put pre-filters on this so you don't actually process every single request so that can keep costs down. And ultimately, everything that can be implemented in this way can be verified through existing tools and methods. Again, we're not having to reinvent the wheel, we're just creating a, a Hail Mary solution to circumvent bad issues for edge cases. So the three columns I mainly spoke about at Tech SEO Boost were all technical. So they were mainly around the, uh, basically the potential that it can impact and affect all the requests between the client and the server. We have not yet been able to find one of those through testing, but we haven't purposely put in there to see if it works. But again, when we're working with a technology like this, which is still quite new and still being basically explored to its full extent, there is that caveat to go in there. Um, there is a potential to add latency and slow down load speeds, but again, from what we've been seeing with testing, it can vary between 10 milliseconds and 50 milliseconds. For a bit of comparison with that, ODN advertise that their latency for their platform is 35 milliseconds. So what we found with this is if your website's fast and optimized, it's more towards the 10. If you're trying to load eight gigabyte images and big media, it's going to be closer towards the 50. So fast sites are fast, slow sites are slow. Again, it's how all works in that way. And we also have a potential to introduce front end bugs, which when you're trying to debug for a CDN, it can be quite difficult. Um, whether or not it's what's been modified or what's actually been injected through the stream transformation as to what's causing the issue. And this can cause more issues, but like I said, being able to pull it back pretty much straight away is is one of the main benefits of this technology because within Cloudflare, whether or not you put your authentication key into a tool like Sloth or Spark and hit deploy, it's out there, you can roll that back. Likewise, in Cloudflare's dashboard itself, you can copy and paste your code in or write it there, deploy, again, roll it back if you notice a bug straight away. So it's quite quick to roll back. And if you do roll it back, there's no, it won't cause any issues because you are modifying requests so the underlying code base remains unaffected. On that note, one one of the main things which, I mean, even John Mueller raised this on Twitter today is this isn't designed to be a circumvention of traditional development practices. If the website has a code freeze, for example, it isn't designed for the SEO to go rogue and update stuff on the edge and kind of get around the code freeze. Likewise, it's not designed for agencies to do that either. If an agency is going to start dating code without the client really knowing or disregarding the client's instruction of a code freeze. They're probably going to try to find ways of doing that anyway without this as a tool. Similarly, if you're going to disregard developers and circumvent them, again, there's other ways to do that for most things without this as well. When at Tech Airbus, one thing I did say in the Q&A afterwards was the importance of integrating this into the existing workflows for business. For example, in any business, if the Cloudflare worker, or sorry, if Cloudflare's authentication key and Cloudflare's main dashboard for a full website and web assets is openly available, like with any CDNs, like my capsule, there's ways to modify parts of a website and even take a website down just with our access through things like page rules um, and other edge technologies for Akamai. So if that's openly available anyway, and anyone can grab hold of it within the organization, there's potential they can cause risk for the site anyway. This, okay, this is giving them more tools and more ways to damage it, but it's an existing risk. 
So that's why, every, especially with things like Cloudflare authentication, we've purposely made, when developing Sloth, some things unuser friendly. Um, for, so, for example, if you do want to deploy directly from our Sloth platform, you've got to, each time you want to deploy, enter your Cloudflare username and copy and paste your authentication key. There's no way to store those credentials so you can speed up the process. The two main reasons behind that are, A, we appreciate people who have access to Sloth, might not be the same people who are the webmasters or the server guys who have access to the Cloudflare account. And that authentication key is a very powerful key. And again, that's putting the accountability and the responsibility in the wrong person's hands and the gating process. Secondly, is that we don't store that because if we store that authentication key, we can actually invalidate the company's PCI compliance. And that goes down to a compliance issue, which again, are some of the issues which have been raised around this technology. But as I said previously, if your Cloudflare is not two-factor, not a lockdown, anyone in the organization can access it these issues already exist. And that kind of then goes on to what I said there about negating process. So with most companies we work with, they have specific dev sign up processes, they have change management meetings, they have um, note circulations about what's being pushed when, how things are going to be affected after they've gone through QA regression testing, after they've been tested properly. Once this is designed to to basically get around a lot of issues. It's not designed to get around businesses existing processes and it needs to be in integrated fully with those. And that goes down to two things. One, having the Cloudflare access and two, having the Sloth access or Spark access or there's multiple weight, there's multiple um, actual things being released on GitHub as well, which are open source for things like logging, A-B testing. Regardless, it's that process side of things as well. And as an industry, I feel that's going to be one of our bigger challenges because being honest, when I started calling this Edge SEO, I did it to try and make it easy to explain to people because if you're going to go up to someone and go, I've got this solution, it's to do with using a surplus application written in JavaScript to deploy on a CDN. From experience, most people are going to be turned off by that. They're not going to understand it because you've gone in at a very high technical level than trying to sell that into someone. Whereas, do you want, we've got this Edge SEO thing. Edge SEO actually sound, lowers that barrier and makes it sound a little bit sexier in that way. And that's purely what that term is in that respect. But what's important is that it's managed as a process within a business. And even though some SEOs are going to have to want to use it and pull the trigger without doing that, chances are that's just an innate nature and we're going to do that anyway regardless of whether or not it's cloudflare workers um, whatever fastly come up with or the next technology after this it's about incorporating these risks into our processes understanding them and taking that time because especially with some of the things especially around pre-render and hate to if we turn around to a business and say we can sustain organic performance for six months at this cost while you're getting to this level. Some of them might see it as a risk worth taking and the buying won't be as hard to get. But just going ahead and doing it isn't ethical anyway. So really, that's end of what I've really got to say. So what I'd like to do is pass back to John and open up to any questions. Brilliant, Dan. Thank you very much. Um... Great content, really, really interesting subject. And I think there's there's a load of questions off the back of it as well, which is fantastic. I think just for me as well, I just wanted to start with just what you, you talked about at the very, very end there, just from us, you know, from myself personally, it's, you know, as SEOs, we, we tend to push boundaries and, and try and push the boundaries as far as it's possible to be done. And, and this all sounds really, in, you know, really interesting ways of doing things, you know, but do you, do you foresee any risks in, in working in this way? Um, and, and do you see any Google changes in some respects down the line? If you, you know, you, you say you, you hounded out the Bing guys, Google guys said it was possible to be done. Would you, would you see them maybe re-evolving this in some way or, and, and do you see any risks with this, this method? The only, so in terms of that, the only main risk I see in terms of the longevity of being able to do this would be Bing, Google, etc. changing how they fundamentally 
react to content served through CDN. So we know that they can, I mean, we, we wrote an article ourselves back in 2015 on how to overcome some Cloudflare CDN issues because we were doing things with CDNs back then. But <laughs> the, main, the main issue is it's just if they'd have to change how they fundamentally serve that, because if you're serving content through Cloudflare anyway, or Akamai Encapsular, Cloudfront, you're already serving through a CDN. All you're doing with this is just modifying that request and modifying what is actually being served back ever so slightly. So I think in order for this to lose longevity, lose its viality almost, they'd have to change how they handle how they handle content from all CDNs. And then mm. that would be, I feel that would be quite a big step change now given the number of websites that use CDNs and how CDNs are built. So I think it'd be like trying to almost reinvent the brick to build a house, to be honest. It's a good accolade, yeah. Good way of putting it, actually, analogy-wise. I and mean, you're right, actually. It's a good way. Look, it has been around for quite a few years. I mean, as you say, I can think of different technologies going back over the years where you could just go about inserting stuff into the website on the fly. Um, we're, we're having to go through this part, you know, the actual dev process in some respects you alluded to. Um, Ruth Casper just asked a question as well, just around... Um, you know, is this kind of open to all types of sites? Obviously, we talk about HTML and stuff like that, but she's particularly focused on C Sharp um, and C Sharp from an SEO perspective, and, and and then obviously this process. You know, is this something that you could you can go down that route with, um, or is it you know kind of rebuild and rethink? Um, I'm going to be honest. It, it's been I think the last time I saw a C Sharp site was around about the same time I saw sites built with Laravel and Cold Fusion. Um, <laughs> it, it's not something I've seen for quite, to be honest, it's not a platform we've tested this on either, to be completely honest and open there. That's um, probably such a small part of the marketplace anyway, in some respects. Yeah. I'd, I'd, to be honest, I'd imagine if it's capable of taking a CDN, it's capable of being modified in this way. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd probably have, yeah, without looking at the site itself and running a test on too sharp, which I've actually made a note, which we're going to probably do now. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Ruth. So we've got a new dev for sloth. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I think I think I really I'm really hesitant to say these words, but I think it it depends um, on the site itself because if code bases are generally quite bad, you can do what you want with Edge, but still going to be underlying issues. If that makes sense. Absolutely, no, without a doubt. I think just you know adding to that from my point of view as well. Obviously the. the sites are built in different ways and obviously we're talking about pushing boundaries and, and stuff like this do you would you foresee any sort of ranking risks um obviously you talked about speed in the millisecond sense so you're probably ticking the box from a point of view of site speed um which obviously is a major factor for google anyway these days but do you foresee any sort of ranking risks with going down this route um i mean all the tests and all sort of like the sites that we know we've got this kind of like in the wild and live at the moment um which unfortunately I can't name any through NDAs, which is annoying because uh, they're great examples. But essentially, every time we've implemented this, we've it's just been, I'm going to be honest, it's been quite boring. There's been no fireworks. There's been nothing exciting. It's just been, oh, it, it works. But, and then it's carried on, um, which I guess when you're doing something like this, boring is probably the best. But... We haven't seen any issues with that. The only terms we've seen issues with things like rankings or anything like that, if people have generally got it configured wrong. So we've seen some people try to, like, for example, do English for the rest of the world through hreflang by doing en-rw. And then they come back and go, oh, hreflang is saying it's broken. I'm like, yeah, that's because you're doing English for Rwanda. And it's like, it, it's the only issues we've really encountered with this are still the, the squishy pink things on the other side of the keyboard doing the typing and not the technology itself. Squishy pink things, that's, that's the best one, yeah. <laughs> uh, as a user error effect, effectively then, yeah, you only use, yeah, in some respect. And have you seen it, I mean, have you seen any, obviously we talk about English languages and stuff from the HF lang point of view, have you seen any you know, language barriers or language issues with this process or is it simple as it's it's in the code and the code's there and you know whatever we run the code, it runs for the engine? 
Yeah, I mean, JavaScript is a pretty universal language. Um, essentially, if you can write JavaScript, you, you can write the Cloudflare Worker bundle. Um, once you deploy them, they're self-sufficient. Um, I mean, I'm being honest, but we've built Sloth. Sloth is in the English language because, being honest, it's a side project that we've built on the side but has had no money going to it. So we potentially will translate it in future. But mm -hmm. The majority of tools, the majority of everything out there, unfortunately, is in the English language. And it'd be great if it was not. It'd be great if it was more language diverse. But when it comes down to JavaScript and coding languages, yeah, if you can code, if you can write JavaScript, you can do this. Cloudflare is multilingual as a platform. The barriers are quite low with regards to that. Yeah, no, definitely. So our next question um, from James Lang is, you know, effectively, are, would he be losing any major functionality with Sloth if they don't have an enterprise Cloudflare plan uh, with more than one script? You know, for example, being able to update custom title tags on multiple pages. Yeah, so um, so with that, there's two things. So, I mean, the website, my personal site runs on a free Cloudflare plan. Again, it, it's a, it, it's to be completely transparent. It's running on a very cheap um, droplet on DigitalOcean. It's on a free Cloudflare plan. Um, I'm actually concerned that people have gone to it at the moment because I don't know how it deals with traffic because it never gets any. Um, so if it's down, if it's if it's down for people, sorry. Um, but essentially, so in Cloudflare's free plan, you have page rules. Um, you are limited to the number of page rules you can have, but this is separate to that. So on their free plan, you need to enable. Cloudflare workers, which is five dollars a month, ten million requests, and then it's like fifty cents for every million requests after. With that, you can deploy as much as you want um, in terms of work code. There's no line limits. There's no limits around that. So if you want to write multiple title tags, run the redirects, and implement hreflang, you can do. And um, it's just code bundles that you deploy. Right. Okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense to me. Hopefully, that does to to James and the guys. So it seems like a pretty simple kind of process to run through. Um, and just following on from that as well. Obviously, uh, Ritika just came with a question. What's the best uh, worker recipe to use for doing meta tags using Cloudflare? Um, to be honest, this, this, it can kind of, it can be self written um, itself. In terms of worker recipe, um, I, there's probably code examples I can share. So. What we are doing with Sloth is, so this is another bit of transparency, we have had it in alpha stage with about 200 people for the past sort of few months. And we've taken, well, basically since November, we've taken as much as many learnings from that as we can. Um, and we've started to write the documentation, especially around things like log file analysis, but we are gonna be opening it up completely tomorrow for the public. And with that, we are gonna actually start putting in example recipe codes, but when you use something with Sloth, we've designed to write the recipe code um, for the service worker, um, to use your terminology for you. So you can literally copy paste it into Cloudflare or deploy through Sloth. It's it's there and it's ready. Um, yeah. With that, there is some documentation around that because Cloudflare have really, really like invested a lot in the serverless community um, and so forth around it. So, Myself and Igor, the developer is doing this. We're actually speaking at Serverless London next week, um, which is just going to be a big geek fest, and I'm really looking forward to it. But it's essentially, it's, it's basically a JavaScript worker. Um, there's lots of examples out there on how to do it in terms of the best way to do it. It's whatever works for your level of ability to code, really. And then you can deploy it, test it, it works good. If not, pull back and rechange. Fantastic. Which a uh, good timing with that question, then, by the looks of it, which is which is fantastic. Um, George Raw is just asking from uh, for pre-render. Can can he obviously use Sloth instead of pre-render.io? You know, this uh, this service offers service space to render the pages. Would he need to create logic from zero? Or do do you know? Do does it work with uh, the server works? So. We're actually, I'm actually going to be putting documentation live on this later. So essentially, you still need um, pre render IO, you still need render tron, you still need that pre render service. But it's about how it's implemented that makes it a more cost effective manner. So at the moment, you'll be pre rendering all requests and pre rendering everything to the client from the server. Whereas by using a Cloudflare worker and doing it through the 
CDN, you're basically pre-rendering the cache requests. So you probably pull that once a day. Um, when you update a page, it'll pull the cache as Cloudflare does. Um, so rather than pre-rendering every single request, you're pre-rendering the cache ones for the full site. So the costs go down massively in how much you're actually pre-rendering because you're relying on the service on the, on the Cloudflare worker to provide the service of actually doing it for you. So it's a combination of it's basically using the same technologies but implementing them in a slightly different way. Right, which makes a lot of, a lot of sense, definitely. Um, which was quite nice seeing the uh, question from Sam is just how about whether this is you know is this or do you perceive this as a long-term solution um you know obviously we talked about risks and stuff like that but is, is this a long-term solution or is it just something that's intended to implement until clients can make changes on their infrastructure you know because obviously you, you alluded to and i've had it in the past where you kind of go and ask you know one of the devs to make some changes on a big financial site and they can't touch it for six months because it's in lockdown is is this a a quick win and a solution for that or is this something that long term is just no issues and, and carry on as, as long as you want um i think i think again the, the horrible answer is it depends so we've got one client who has been running redirects from a previous from what well, it was a platform and domain migration from git pages to wordpress they've been running right now coming up on the calendar year um, and it just works fine there's potential ways we could handle those redirects in other ways now, but it's just working. It's cost effective. It's just chipping away in the background. Mm -hmm. Google's, Google's respected it as it would a normal migration. Everything's like, like I said, it, it's kind of boring how it works, but it, it just works. <laughs> um, it works. Yeah. Um, but in terms of that, there's some things which could be done long term. So things like HF line across multi platform, HF line in general, AB testing. It, it can, it, because it's self-sufficient and it's a self-sufficient bundle and doesn't require the maintenance, if you want to do a quick fix for six months before development can get around to doing it properly, use it as a quick fix. It, it, it's designed to be that edge case solution to get you where you need to be. So I've worked with some people who, the devs, so the developers have um, hard-coded canonical tags mm -hmm. on pages incorrectly. And they've been saying, and that's come from a dev push, but they can't then roll it back. Or there's been other, well, there's other issues around that. But it's like, okay, so that you're losing traffic, you're losing revenue, and it's going to take you six months to fix this. For a temporary measure, let's just fix those canonicals by overwriting them with a Cloudflare worker, get your traffic back up, keep your revenue going, and basically keep your business alive. Um, yeah. And six months down the line, fix it properly, turn off a Cloudflare worker, and carry on. Which, which makes a great deal of sense. There's a question from uh, Ian here as well. You mentioned um, pseudo log files. Really, right back at the start of the talk, there was, you, you mentioned the fact of obviously real log files and pseudo log files. Just wonder whether you could dive into that a little bit more as to, you know, what's the difference uh, and how's, you know, what's the pros and cons in some respect? Yeah, so with that, um, essentially, so this was a solution developed for people on. Salesforce, Commerce Cloud, Flash Demand, where Shopify, anything where basically you can't access your own logs um, due to the structure and the nature of the platform. So essentially, we have, we've actually got full documentation up on for about serve logs on Sloth.cloud as well, um, which can be worth reading. But essentially, at that request stage, we can pass off into something like Log DNA or Logly. Um, we can pass the requests off. So you get the log file data from the request. So whilst it strictly isn't the server, it's still the request that's being made to the server. Um, I've run it on my site for quite a while, um, mm -hmm. to be honest, up until the Logly trial finished and I collected all the requests as you would, export them, analyze them as you would. It, it just kind of gives you that power back. But with compliance as well, that you also have to take into account when you're handling log file data, you're handling user IPs, um, everything like that. So all the natural compliance and procedures you go around with log file analysis, you would here, but rather than just collecting it on a load balancer, I mean, to be honest, you probably could collect it on like an S3 bucket or something like that. Mm -hmm. You're just collecting it in your own way, um, but directly from the request before it hits the server, and then it just processes the rest of it and works as normal for the client. Right, fantastic. A, a couple of questions around Sloth. We've talked about Sloth 
quite a bit now kind of thing. And one question we just had in is, you know, what do you do if you don't have sloth? Um, there's, so <laughs> we, what else can you go out there to the marketplace for? As you mentioned, obviously sloth is something which you developed internally. Um, yeah, well, to be honest, um, so sloth actually exists as a free tool. Um, tomorrow from probably about 10 a.m., you'll be able to go create an account, um, access it. It's It's been designed that way. So when, as I said, when we were going through all the research, I basically wanted to find a way of doing it where I wasn't annoying my developers to the point of my existence being questioned. So they basically made me a generator. I then said, how can you make, can, can we scale this to make other people use it? And that's where Sloth kind of came from. Um, other people have developed stuff as well. So Chris Green has developed Spark, um, which is similarly, it's, See, this is one of these things because, I mean, another thing on this side as well, Sloth is free. Um, it's an open source code base. If you want to use it, use it. If you want to take the code and run, it's, it's licensed under MIT. So, yeah, just don't sell it. Um, <laughs> but, but ultimately, this, is, this isn't, when we developed this, this wasn't a technology and an accessibility thing where we looked and thought, oh, we could actually make money here. It was a case of this could actually help people. And... There's a lot of people I work with who work in house who aren't highly technical, but something like this could be the difference between a job or no job and things like that. Right. So there's on GitHub, um, there's a lot of code uh, pins that people have pushed, which have got worker codes in, which you can do stuff with. Um, I don't know how far along Spark is, um, but I believe that might be in a beta phase at the moment. Like I said, Sloth, um, which you, you'll be able to access tomorrow. Um, for free. Um, there are going to be in the future some things on it which potentially might be premium, but none of the core services are because ultimately we've not, this isn't inventing anything new. This is just taking something existing and finding a way to use it for our purposes. And we don't feel that should be gate, like gatekeepered for $5 a month or anything like that. No, absolutely. And uh, it, it's really interesting to see that. Um... Everything's, you know, in that sense, it's all out there. It's open source kind of thing. I think just talking about certain sites and verticals, and you've talked about scaling um, as well. I mean, from your experience, have you found any, you know, is it a case that you, you can see it working across all sites um, and verticals? Or, or, is, or there is maybe is there something where there is a limit where you're maybe going to push the boundaries? Or you know, is it just something which is just going to be self-propagating even to the biggest of e-commerce sites? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, probably one of the biggest, so I'm just trying to think, going through my head quickly of all the sites I know which are currently using this um, in the wild that we've helped with it. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the biggest ones, major global brands, 60 million requests probably a day for analytics. That, that's a solution for them. Um, we've got multiple sites using it for redirects on big, big scales, and they're not, what one of them especially is not a small website whatsoever. Um, it's just working fine for them. It, it kind of depends really on the, on the manageability and what I say kind of goes down the process as well because it's so easy to create these worker codes and deploy them. It's about making sure you've got change logs, making sure you've got versions, everything basically the process is around it. This technology, in theory, could scale as high as you want it to. It's just whether or not you can control, maintain, and catalog what it is you're doing so that if you do need to roll back or change something, you're not knocking over all the dominoes you've stacked up and you can extract okay. No, fantastic. All right, just obviously we're running out of time quickly here, and as we always do, it's just the hour flies by. One kind of final question, because it's a, it's a really interesting subject, and as, uh, as you alluded to, um, Dan, that it's kind of been around for a few years now and it's been ticking away in the background and people have used it in different ways and there's more and more talk of it and you know, ironically very much today um, in the marketplace about you know SEO on the edge and edge SEO as such um, so let's think about it going forward you know what what do you see this heading in the future you know mm -hmm. what's the next steps maybe for the technology and, and maybe what's the next steps for the, the usage or the, the increased usage of this within you know SEO and maybe how the engines will react to that. Well, we already we already can kind of see from a, a technical perspective, not just SEO, just from a pure development perspective, that 
we're already on the like the verge of having completely serverless and originless websites anyway. Um, so fully cloud, no origin server in that respect. So that in itself is a modification on the edge. Um, with regards to SEO, I mean, like I said, with regards to search engines, I kind of feel they'd have to fundamentally change how they processed every CDN in the world and how they process the content from it, um, which, being honest, I don't see happening just because of a massive step change it would be for every business yeah, out there. I very um, much agree to you on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so with that, it's just how we know how on the SEO side, we've got ideas of how search engines are evolving. We understand how they're getting better in terms of processing data because we're, unless they find a way to circumnavigate a CDN and modified responses and things like this, which I don't think they will because again, it's a big step change in how they process the CDN itself. We're going to be able to continue to provide them a modified code base they can render. And again, if they start being able to render it, it's because they changed how they render every code language on the, on the internet anyway. So big step change. I think the longevity of it is if we move in probably 10, 15 years, if we've all moved to completely serverless, originless websites anyway, this is pretty much going to be the norm. Things like sloth are going to be pretty redundant. Um, but at this moment in time, it's kind of looking ahead. This is kind of a technology which could be the norm in the future for everybody, but we can use for really drastic edge cases now. Fantastic. Well, we're out of time, guys. Um, as always, the hour flies by. And, um, you know, thank you to all of you that attended today. And appreciate that you guys are starting to get off and uh, wrap up the day before you guys head home in the UK. And obviously, thank you to our listeners that we usually get from multiple countries around the world. Obviously, a massive thank you to um, Mr. Dan Taylor, uh, with the Salt Agency, for um, his insights into SEO on the edge. So thank you, Dan, for taking the time to come along and be on the Deep Core webinar. It's been a pleasure, John. Thank you. No, thank you, sir. Um, as I mentioned at the start, as always, the webinar is recorded um, and there will be a recap fully published onto the Deep Crawl blog by tomorrow lunchtime um, to allow you guys to obviously have a, the recording and then I'll be, get all the questions and all the feedback and all the uh, pieces that Dan covered across his presentation. Um, and there is a survey as you log out. Please, please, please do take the 15 or so seconds that it takes to fill in the survey when you come out of obviously uh, go to meeting. Really would love to hear your thoughts on future uh, webinars and anything that we could be doing better. Uh, so please, please, please do take the time to do that. We love that feedback. And talking about our next webinar, we still are yet to confirm the date in March, but our next webinar, as always, will be in, in the next month. And this one in March will be a, a great webinar again. Um, super excited to have Mr. Martin Split of Google. Um, who will be coming along and to discuss all things JavaScript in a very similar way to our John Mueller one that we did in December, um, where we went through very much a Q&A type process. And we're going to go through the same process with Martin. So please start to think about your questions. Uh, watch out for, uh, obviously, the marketing team at DeepCrawl putting out the date for that specific uh, webinar and get yourself signed up and get on board. So again, a massive thank you to everybody that attended today. And uh, my name is John Myers, and this has been the Deep Core webinar on SEO on the Edge. Thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you next month for uh, our next webinar. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>